Episode number 36. Oh. They'll find him guilty, said the other. Don't you be afraid of that. Mr. Cruncher's attention was here diverted to the doorkeeper, whom he saw making his way to Mr. Lorry, with the note in his hand. Mr. Lorry sat at a table, among the gentlemen in wigs, not far from a wigged gentleman, the prisoner's counsel, who had a great bundle of papers before him, and nearly opposite another wigged gentleman with his hands in his pockets, whose whole attention, when Mr. Cruncher looked at him then, or afterwards, seemed to be concentrated on the ceiling of the court. After some rough coughing, and rubbing of his chin, and signing with his hand, Jerry attracted the notice of Mr. Lorry, who had stood up to look for him, and who quietly nodded, and sat down again. What's he got to do with the case? Asked the man he had spoken with. Blessed, if I know, said Jerry. What have you got to do with it, then, if a person may inquire? Blessed, if I know that either, said Jerry. The entrance of the judge, and a consequent great stir, and settling down in the court, stopped the dialogue. Presently, the dock became the central point of interest. Two jailers, who had been standing there, went out, and the prisoner was brought in, and put to the bar. Everybody present, except the one-wigged gentleman, who looked at the ceiling, stared at him. All the human breath in the place, rolled at him, like a sea, or a wind, or a fire. Eager faces strained round pillars, and corners, to get a sight of him. Spectators in back rows stood up, not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court, laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them, to help themselves, at anybody's cost, to a view of him, stood a tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing, to see every inch of him. Conspicuous among these latter, like an animated bit on the spiked wall of Newgate, Jerry stood aiming at the prisoner the beery breath of a wet he had taken as he came along, and discharging it to mingle with the waves of other beer, and gin, and tea, and coffee, and what not, that flowed at him, and already broke upon the great windows behind him in an impure mist, and rain. The object of all this staring, and glaring, was a young man of about five and twenty, well-grown, and well-looking, with a sunburnt cheek, and a dark eye. His condition was that of a young gentleman. He was plainly dressed in black, or very dark grey, and his hair, which was long, and dark, was gathered in a ribbon at the back of his neck, more to be out of his way than for ornament. As an emotion of the mind will express itself through any covering of the body, so the paleness, which his situation engendered came through the brown upon his cheek, showing the soul to be stronger than the sun. He was otherwise quite self-possessed, bowed to the judge, and stood quiet. The sort of interest with which this man was stared, and breathed at, was not a sort that elevated humanity. Had he stood in peril of a less horrible sentence, had there been a chance of any one of its savage details being spared, by just so much would he have lost in his fascination. The form that was to be doomed to be so shamefully mangled, was the sight, the immortal creature that was to be so butchered and torn asunder, yielded the sensation. Whatever gloss the various spectators put upon the interest, According to their several arts, and powers of self-deceit, the interest was, at the root of it, odrish. 